This webinar is on the topic of advocacy to support the Advocacy Toolkit, which was prepared by the Advocacy Circle. The Advocacy Circle is a group of like-minded dissentients from across Canada who want to work for justice. Our members come from the Maritimes, Quebec, Ontario, Alberta, and British Columbia. Our work is recognized and endorsed by the National Council of the Society. In this webinar, we will explore why we are called to be advocates in support of our neighbors who live in poverty and look at some ways to move the social justice agenda forward. Danny Bourne, who lives in Toronto, and Corey Wink, who lives in Ottawa, will be presenting this webinar. We have both been involved in advocacy for many years, as well as being home visitors for our respective conferences. We want to acknowledge the work of our brother Stephen Dufresne from Edmonton, who participated in the development of this webinar, but who cannot be here today. So poverty, advocacy, social justice. As Vincentians, we see poverty, sometimes deep poverty, when we serve in our neighbors in need and we learn from them. We can begin to understand their needs and work with, work with them to develop advocacy plans that will lead to greater social justice. And through advocacy, we can help bring about economic and social changes that benefit us all. So poverty is very complex. We each have many beliefs about what poverty is. Some of them are helpful and lead us in positive directions, and some are not. You know that people who live in poverty lack important things like safe, secure housing, nutritious food, and many other basic needs. We may not know how their circumstances came about. Sometimes we think that people in poverty are unemployed and may not want to work. However, statistics from food banks show that an increasing number of their users are in fact employed. The minimum wage rates are too low to let people afford shelter, food, and other basic needs. And sometimes their work doesn't give enough paid hours to pay the bills. Sometimes when we listen to people that we serve, we learn that they had jobs in the past, but lost them due to circumstances beyond their control, such as automation. Or maybe they had a bad accident or they got sick. Often poverty leads to depression because lack of food and decent housing causes people to be depressed. Sometimes we think that people who live in poverty commit more crimes, but research shows that they really don't. They do end up in prison more often because the justice system feels more harshly with them because they can't afford good lawyers or nice clothes to make a good impression on the court. And so they are treated more harshly and sentenced more severely. Sometimes we think that all people living in poverty are homeless and we think we see all of them on the street. But in many ways, poverty is an invisible condition. And one recent statistic says that one in seven or 4.9 million Canadians live in poverty. There are many faces of poverty. The measure of the greatness of a society is the way is found in the way it treats those in need, those who have nothing apart from their poverty. This statement made by Pope Francis has been stated by many different social justice advocates over time. Canadians like to think of themselves as a nation that treats its people well and that we do the best that we can. But statistics show otherwise. One in five Canadian children lives in poverty. What does that bode for the future of our country? One in 10 Canadians can't afford to buy the prescriptions that their doctors order. The number of food bank users increases every year. Is this really the best that we can do? We need to understand that poverty costs us all money. People who live in poverty spend more time in hospitals, prisons, and shelters, which all cost a lot more than humane social programs. There are estimates that poverty costs us between 72 and $84 billion every year. So 
So poverty is a condition of being without some of the essentials of life, such as food, clothing, education, shelter, financial resources. In practical terms, if we look at the condition of people on various kinds of social assistance or low-wage jobs, they lack many essential things, such as safe, secure place to live that is suitable for the size of their household. They lack healthy food that includes fruits, vegetables, and protein in sufficient quantity. It's so bad sometimes that I recently read in a national newspaper that some people were reduced to one meal per day if they depended on social assistance. Some groups of people are more likely to live in poverty. They include people with disabilities, indigenous people, women, especially if they are single mothers, racialized people, people with mental illness, and increasingly the elderly. So poverty is not just poverty. There are different levels of poverty. We have absolute poverty, and we have relative poverty. So absolute poverty is when the household income is below a certain level, which makes it impossible for the person or family to meet the basic needs of life, including food, clothing, shelter, education, and health care. We often think that poverty like this exists in other places, not in Canada. But a single person on social assistance in Ontario receives $722 per month for all their needs, $1,075 if they're disabled. Their income is less than half the poverty line. Some of the people that I visit pay more than $500 for a single room in a dilapidated house. That means they have $222 left for everything else. Can they afford basic necessities of food, clothing, transportation, when they receive such low incomes? And it's not just in Ontario. Other jurisdictions in Canada provide a similar level of income. And I suggest that there are people in Canada who live in absolute poverty. Is this the kind of country we want to be? Now, relative poverty happens when people receive more than the low income measure, but less than the median income. So median income is calculated by considering the total number of tax filers in Canada. So if there are 20 million plus one tax filers in Canada, the person who is number 10 million and one in that distribution has the income that becomes the median income for Canada. Median income means that 10 million people earn less than that person and 10 million people earn more. In Canada, the median income for a family of four is about $80,000 per year. Now the low income measure is the poverty line and it's calculated as 50% of the median income. So a family of four, which has less than $40,000, lives in poverty. And of course, the lower the income, the deeper the poverty. So $40,000 is the low income measure, the poverty line, and $80,000 is the median income. People who have less income than the median income, but more than the low income measure, are considered to live in relative poverty. Their incomes would be between $40,000 or $3,300 per month and $80,000, $6,700 per month. Remember, this is for a family of four people. They may be able to afford adequate shelter, basic nutritious diet, and a few extras. However, shelter costs are a huge drain on people's income. In Ottawa in the summer of 2022, the average rent for a two-bedroom apartment is $2,000 per month. And a two-bedroom apartment is probably a tight fit for a family of four. They should have a three-bedroom apartment. These folks probably shop at thrift stores. Their children don't play hockey or have music lessons or go on vacations. And the lack of those enrichment activities mean that they don't have the opportunities to develop social skills to compete with their better-off peers. Their social status will be evident when they are in school or anywhere out in the world. 
And because of this, they may struggle in higher education or in the workforce. The closer that a family's income is to the median, the more comfortable their life will be. 50% of people in Canada have an income which is less than the median income, and they are at a disadvantage materially, but especially socially, because their lifestyle lacks opportunity for enrichment. So Catholic, our Catholic faith and Catholic social teachings challenge us to respond to poverty in two different ways, by charitable works, which meet their most basic needs in of people in poverty, and social justice, which works to address the root causes of poverty by improving the social, economic, and government structures. Now, Catholic social teachings are not stated in a single document like the Ten Commandments. There are different ways of stating them, depending on whose version you read. Sometimes there are seven, sometimes there are 10, and they evolve. However, the principles are consistent and they always complement each other. One Catholic social teaching recognizes the dignity of the human being. That means that no matter the age, state of health or background of the person, we are called to respect them because their dignity is equal to ours. Another Catholic social teaching is called the preferential option for the poor. This teaching calls us to get out of our comfort zone in the service of people in need. And Frederick Ozanam said it beautifully. He said, the order of society is based on two virtues, justice and charity. However, justice presupposes a lot of love already for one needs to love a man a great deal to respect his rights which limit our rights and his liberty, which hampers our liberty. Justice has limits where charity has none. But there's a practical side too. We are called to social justice because we know that in today's complex society, we cannot bring about justice and well-being for everyone by charity alone. We need for all of society to take responsibility for the welfare of its people. Only if that happens, can all people meet their basic needs, be healthy and participate fully in society. And research shows that countries which accept this and have progressive social programs have happier, healthier people. Rich people are happier and poor people are happier. Everyone is. So if this is so clear, why is it not happening, happening in our Canadian society? Because we lack social and political will to make the necessary changes in our economic, business and government structures and policies. Many groups put pressure on elected officials to protect their interests. Businesses and corporations advocate for tax structures that benefit them. Military people want to ensure that they have resources to do their work. Provinces and territories want to protect their turfs. Indeed, there are many pressures on decision makers. But one voice that has not been heard enough is the voices of people who care about marginalized people in our country. As a result, minimum wages and social assistance rates have stagnated. Healthcare progress, such as farmer care, has stalled. Care for immigrants and indigenous people is inadequate. We need to change that and make our concern for people in need heard. And Vincentians are not alone in this quest. There are other faiths and civil society groups who share our concerns. We need to identify them and work with them to present a strong voice to the various levels of government about what we want for our people and our country. Remember, the greatness of the society is found in the way it treats those in need. It really is about honoring the worth, the dignity, and the image of God in every person that we encounter as a member of the human race. So, social justice. We have to clarify what we mean by social justice. 
social justice embodies a vision that all its members are psychologically and physically safe. Social justice requires that all members have a fair allocation of the community resources so that they will be able to live a fulfilling life and be active contributors to their communities. The pillars of a just society are income security so that everyone is able to meet their basic needs, which include safe shelter, access to nutritious food, health care, basic, basic clothing, transportation, and communication. Health care is another pillar of a just society, which should provide preventative care, such as dental care, as well as care in case of serious accident or catastrophic illness. Access to education is another pillar because it is a cornerstone for participation in the economy and the community. Finally, a fair justice system is important to the maintenance of a civil and progressive society. There are many fronts on which we can advocate for a more just society, but as Vincentians, we see most glaringly the material need of our fellow citizens. And we can advocate convincingly for improving support for incomes, because when that is accomplished, the other elements will be easier to accomplish. So bring up the topic of social justice and you'll get a wide range of social, economic and political views and responses on the topic. For sure, when we talk with people, there will be many opinions on how much income support, how much health care, how much education, and how much justice reform. We need to work with our brothers and sisters to figure this out. For sure, there will always be people who are better off and those who are less well off. We have to decide what we want for our country. So social justice has to do with protecting and standing with those who cannot speak for themselves. It's about honoring the worth and dignity of every person. The rule and statutes of the society of the updated rule, rule updated in 2020 states on page 93 that the society helps those in need to speak for themselves. And when they cannot, the society speaks on their behalf so that they will not be ignored. This speaks to the Catholic social teaching of solidarity, which states that we are all equal in God's sight and we have a responsibility to each other. We are each other's keeper. So God's will is social justice for all of creation. Vincentians and other people of goodwill are the hearts and minds who are called to bring this about. Thanks very much, Corey. Uh, very well stated. Puts that perspective of poverty in into a good context. Then this part of the presentation, I would like to talk about advocacy, how we can take action and fight poverty and try to eliminate poverty or lessen it. And I think this depiction of Frederick Ozenam exemplifies our Vincentian approach to social justice. Here we see Frederick with a hand out to the needy people around the table. That represents their charity. That represents our bandaging the wounds of poverty and helping people to deal with the injustices that they face. But we notice Frederick has his other hand in the air. There he is calling attention to the injustices that lead to the poverty we see on the other side of the paper. And it's important to remember that Frederick practiced advocacy himself. He, he had his own newspaper and he wrote many articles advocating for those in need and asking for changes to government systems and government policy to help people in need. He even uh, suggested that government policy should be based upon Christian principles. He believed in this so much, he even ran for office at one point, but uh, he did lose the election. 
So I think it's just important that we know that Frederick was a believer in advocacy. Now, another way of looking at our Vincentian advocacy is to bring it down to our, our basic uh, mission of charity. And that is the home visit. There, we meet the people we serve and we learn about their um, plight. This is where the home visit is where we see the effects of poverty and we have an opportunity to apply the charity to help heal those wounds. Now, our personal interaction with the people we serve help inform us of the root causes of economic justice. This listening and feedback inform us and should prompt us into action. So it should motivate us to act on the behalf of the people we serve. Calling attention in the larger part of society to the problems and we should be suggesting solutions. Advocacy can be looked at and approached in a simple three-step process. As Corey said, it is can be very complex, but let's try to make it a little simpler. First, we need to identify the injustice. So we see that in our home visits. We see lack of access to healthy food, uh, uh, access to housing, inadequate incomes. These are the injustices we see. Secondly, we need to try to identify the causes and the factors. Now, this can be complex. Housing uh, is an example where there's a lot of different factors that can lead to a lack of affordable housing. But I think we just need to focus on the main ones so as to not lose ourselves in, in, in the forest, so to speak. And if we focus on the main issues, then we can prompt ourselves into a, a concerted action. And thirdly, I don't think it's enough to just identify the injustice and identify the causes and factors. I think we need to complete the circle by attempting to identify viable solutions to the problems we are highlighting. So another thing we need to think about with Vincentian advocacy is that if we go down this road, it's not our personal issues that we have to advocate for, but as Corey iterated, we need to speak on behalf of our neighbors in need, not concentrate our own personal issues. So it, it makes it easier because this forces us to focus on poverty issues so that we're not going off in so many different directions can be really easy to uh, have too many issues and then you don't know, you know where to turn next. So let's keep our focus on a few core issues. And I, on the slide here, we see what some of those issues are. I think the main ones, inadequate income, inadequate social assistance, lack of affordable housing, poor wages, poor working conditions, expensive daycare, healthcare, and dental care. So if we can stick to these issues, we can legitimately speak about them because we have firsthand knowledge of how these affect the people we serve through our home visits and through serving the people in need. It's also important to remember that advocacy can work and it does work. And how does it work? through information and education. We need to change policy by changing people's minds and hearts and start to build an intolerance to poverty in our society and not just take it for granted or look the other way when we see it in our midst. So our job is to inform the community, to change the minds and hearts of not just Vincentians, but our parishioners and the public at large. Because politicians and decision makers are spurred into action 
through public opinion. And that's the opinion we need to form. So it's fair to say that advocacy is political, but it's not politics in the pure sense. It's more political in a broader societal sense. Government policy should have the goal of raising people out of poverty. And we have a right to state this and suggest how we, as a society, can achieve this. So we can suggest policy changes and solutions, but what we cannot do as a nonprofit charitable organization is to endorse or promote a particular political party or candidate. But we're free and encouraged to speak on behalf of the people we serve when it comes to government policy. Advocacy, education, and information will help us to build an intolerance for things that were once taken for granted as the status quo. And we have seen change come about through changing the hearts and minds of a critical mass of the community. I think within our lifetimes, most of us here anyway, We've seen how a thing like smoking in public places go from being totally accepted to now basically a total ban. Uh, we wouldn't think of, of smoking in the bank or in the gro grocery stores we used to in, in days past because it's just not publicly tolerated anymore. Recycling programs, there's another example. There was never really any thought made to uh, recycling and, and concern for the environment. But a couple of decades later, and now here we are, and recycling programs are demanded, and they're expected, and they're tolerated. So we can see how advocacy can work. It might take some time, but it will work. And an important way to do this to inform and educate the public is through three different ways, really. It's we have to inform and educate people by first telling stories. Because stories have a, an emotional impact that statistics don't have. We have to appeal to people's minds and hearts. Now we have legitimacy in this because we deal with the people that we are, are, we deal with the people we are helping on a daily basis. So facts and figures are important, but stories have a greater emotional impact. So think of things like that single mother that we visit that's struggling to feed her children or the new uh, Canadians struggling to make it in Canada, and and what are their obstacles? What are their, what are the biases and prejudices out there that work against them? So these are the things that we need to concentrate on, and try to change people's hearts and minds to build that intolerance. How can we do this? We can do it in very simple ways. Um, and one thing we would like to suggest is that on the website, the national website, we have prepared an advocacy toolkit. And if you access it there, it has some of the highlights of this presentation, as well as practical means of how to write a letter to the editor, how to write a newsletter, and so on and so forth. And it has some... Uh, places you can access this information. But just briefly, then use your parish bulletin or a newsletter, perhaps a monthly message on a particular topic in the parish bulletin, or a newsletter to interested parishioners and Vincentians on a particular advocacy issue might be helpful. Letters to the editor and social media are also ways we can get the message across. One thing, though, is that we should be careful to speak individually as a Vincentian, informed of our opinion through our volunteer work as Vincentians. 
We should not profess to speak on behalf of the society and our communications. We should leave that to the designated committees and executive. But that does not prevent us from speaking as individuals and saying that we've come to this opinion through our uh, work with people in need. Now, part of this is we need to educate and inform ourselves. Let's discuss these issues at our conference, particular council meetings, and propose solutions. We need to stay current on the issues affecting the people we serve. We can get this from websites, news stories, newsletters. And I think it's important that we do, as I said before, complete the circle and come up with some solutions that we can propose. So what are other like-minded organizations and advocates proposing? Things like basic income program, social assistance reform, universal childcare, pharmacare, a minimum living wage. These are all the issues that, or sorry, all the solutions that come to alleviate the issues of poverty. I think it's important to suggest these solutions and their viability, not just highlighting the issues. If not, people can sometimes be captured by the poor will always be with us attitude that can prevent positive action. Suggestions for dealing with poverty are abundant. We do not have to research and develop our own, but we can learn from what others are proposing. And an important, as well as informing the public and our fellow Vincentians and our parishioners, it's important that we speak to our elected representatives. And we should not be intimidated by meeting with our elected representatives. It's our responsibility as Vincentians to do so. So your MNA, MLA, MPP, local councillor, they're actually all quite eager to meet and hear from people who are motivated and have a specific project. These are the people that get out and vote. These are the people that they want to hear from. So we can meet as an individual or with a group of Vincentians to express our interests and concerns. We can do this in person, virtually, meet and greet sessions that the politicians hold, letters, emails. Just express yourselves as individuals concerned about poverty through your volunteer experience as Vincentians. Another important thing we need to do to keep advocacy moving along is to designate a social justice rep for your conference or council. Now this person should be uh, charged with presenting a short five or 10 minute discussion at, at your meetings to keep the issues alive, to keep us aware and to keep us informed. And they should always be suggesting ways we can participate in advocacy. We should be uh, not be intimidated or shy to speak up in our community. We have need to represent ourselves there too. So, attending local public meetings to support housing initiatives, to support anti-poverty policies, they're important things to do. And you have to remember, you shouldn't be shy about it because there are many other like-minded people and you'll meet them at these meetings. And so you'll, you'll, you'll feel that you're part of a, a community of advocates. You won't be standing alone. A way to help us do this is to have an awareness of what other like-minded agencies are do doing. So a join existing letter or email campaigns and go to local meetings. Adding our voice to other uh, programs and to what other people are doing just increases the momentum and an attention to the issue. So we can piggyback on what other people are doing. I think another quote from Pope Francis is an important uh, thing. 
to, to consider here, where he calls for us to be a courageous Christian. We cannot become starched Christians, too polite, who speak of theology calmly over tea. We have to become courageous Christians and seek out those who need help most. So there, Pope Francis is calling us to put our faith into actions. We, as Vincentians, have a special calling to fulfill our mission of charity in a responsible manner by including a mission to establish social justice through advocacy. Here are some resources for your consideration where you'll learn more about advocacy and more about practical ways of uh, achieving it. The Citizens for Public Justice website is a very good one. Canada Without Poverty and Campaign 2000 all provide practical examples and uh, also provide those solutions you might be looking for to, to propose. So it's a good place to start to learn a little bit more about advocacy. So we can't just talk about advocacy. We have to do something about it. So let's get the ball rolling. We think the time is right to promote a basic income program for low income families and individuals coordinated at the federal level. Now, basic income has been touted as a more effective, humane and dignified means of providing income support than the present social assistance regimes we see in the provinces. It basically puts money directly into the hands of families that need it, stimulating local economies and providing a reasonable quality of life. During the pandemic, the CERB demonstrated the value and practical feasibility of this approach. And it could replace current social assistance regimes that are laden with red tape, they're expensive to administrate, and they burden recipients now with contradictory and restrictive rules and regulations. A basic income program is much simpler. And we saw it work during CERB, and in fact, it's already in place for many Canadians. Seniors, as well as old age security are eligible to receive the guaranteed income supplement. And families with children receive the child tax benefit. Both are designed to lift the recipients out of poverty or almost out of poverty. So really what a basic income program would do is kind of fill in that middle, the middle that's missing. And we see it work very successfully for children and for seniors, it's time to put it into place for those in the middle. So a basic income and for Canada as it's been proposed and supported by the parliamentary budget officer says that it will work and it can reduce poverty. But what does it look like? Well, it would apply to, it would be given to people between the ages of 18 and 64. And they would get a check once a month and that was guaranteed, no strings attached. A single person would get $22,000 per year or $1,800 per month. A couple would get $31,000 per year or almost $2,600 per month. And that amount is about 75% of the poverty line. So it's not exactly riches. You know, people um, worry that if you give people guaranteed income, they won't want to work. But actually what has uh, happening in, in some of the recent uh, uh, projects that they've had is that it encourages people to work because there are, there's um, people can go to work and they can earn some money and top up and get a better quality of life for themselves. Of course, once they get to a certain level of income, then they have to start paying taxes. But the, the level of income that people can earn to improve the quality of, of their lives is much better than it is in um, current welfare systems where there are so many 
regulations and impediments that you earn some money this month and it gets clawed back next month. If people are in a constant state of insecurity because they don't know what their next month's check will look like. With guaranteed income, you get the check every month, you can earn some money, and then if you get, well, if you earn enough money that you can, you don't need it anymore, well, then it will be taken away. Actually, I was just watching a little uh, TikTok video uh, before we started this recording, and somebody was talking about the um, FIT project in Finland, which was over two years. And I remember reading the statistic uh, myself from the um, report report that came at the end of it. And what happened with in Finland was that the people who were on the guaranteed income actually reported more working hours than the people in the control group. So it's not that it was a disincentive, it was an incentive. And it would really benefit actually the economy as well as the individual because um, a lot of employers have just-in-time workforce, you know, gig economy, people just working on short shifts when their business is very busy, like coffee shops or stores. And if people have a, have a basic income, then more people might be willing to work for those short shifts and, and, and gig economy. So it, it actually has benefits for business as well. I think it's worth looking into it and look at the um, universal basic income uh, website here in Canada. And there's another one in uh, Ontario and basic income and Catholicism. Check it out and see what the implications and the benefits are, because for sure uh, there are more benefits than there are problems. And just one last thing I want to say about that is that, um, you know, one of the uh, cases that's been cited more often than any other is the one in the in Manitoba in the 1970s, which ran for five years. Well, that's fine. But in 2018, some young filmmakers from, uh, went and made a Vimeo film about what happened 40 years later to these people. And so these people had benefited from this program for five years. But 40 years later, they were still saying, my life changed, my life is better, all because of that program. So it's not just something that benefits people right here, right now. But the spinoff is that we will have a better society in the long term. So once you learn a little bit about uh, guaranteed basic income, I'm sure you'll be as excited as, as we are and, and, and how much we think it can make a difference in the lives of the people we serve. But it's going to take action. Already, statistics have shown that a majority of Canadians are in favor of some type of the guaranteed income. So you need to add your voice to this. You need to let the policymakers know that, yes, this is, this is a needed thing. So you can just start by signing a petition. And at these two websites you see, basicincomenow.ca and the ubiworks.ca website, there are petitions that you can add your name to, and they'll go to the policymakers. More importantly, write a letter to your member of parliament. Tell them you're a Vincentian, that you visit people in need and you see what the effects that poverty have on them. And the simplest way to alleviate this is to just to put hands in, or sorry, to put money into the hands of people who need it. It's spent locally, stimulates the local economy. So tell them why you support the concept of a universal basic income to help people live a decent life. So I'd like to thank you for your attention and for your interest in this workshop. Corey. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, we hope it will, um, stimulate you to take some action because action is what we need to take.